Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Wednesday afternoon and elephant professional lecture. Um, one of the questions that has come up, it's been baffled me for a, for a, quite a long time, and it comes up very, very often on the face on, on the live streams from all of our guests from around the world. People want to know, they can hear the elephants. Everybody's captivated by the noises that elephants make and, and how they communicate between themselves and, and how and how what the different noises might mean but one of the big questions that was always asked is how are those noises made which bit of the elephant does the elephant vibrate in order to be able to make the lovely noises that they make um, and we don't have any really answers from that apart from looking at them and trying to see which bit may be vibrating luckily some technology has has been invented and been very, very well used by uh, by Veronica, who is our elephant professional lecture, um, lecturer, to, with a camera which shows you which part, which direction the noise comes from. Uh, of course, her science goes a lot deeper than that, and it is going to she's going to answer lots of questions for us about elephant communication and elephant noises and 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 whether they they're born with the ability or whether they have to learn it and what that might tell us about elephant cognition. Um, there we go. I hope I haven't haven't spoiled all the secrets. So it goes a lot deeper than our own my own personal uh, my own personal interest into which bits vibrating. Um, uh, without without any further ado, I will um, I will turn you over to Veronica, who is going to tell us about the flexible sound production in the Asian elephant. They talk big, but they squeak like a mouse. Unlike Veronica. No, no. I Veronica, can. over to you. I will show you how I can squeak <laughs> in a while. <laughs> But well, thanks for the nice introduction, John. And uh, let me say, that I'm really happy that I can be part of this lecture series. It was really a great way to stay connected with all the elephant people um, during the difficult times and also um, to watch your live streams and actually stay connected with the elephants and listen to them once in a while. While I was busy analyzing all the data that I'm gonna present to you now, so I'm a PhD student at the Department of Behavioral and Cognitive Biology in the University of Vienna. And there I study um, communication in Asian and African elephants and also in the cheetah. And uh, today, of course, we will focus on the Asian elephant. And I will take you along a journey to find out more about um, the amazing flexibility of Asian elephants. And this journey will start in their natural habitat, that is the jungle. So imagine you go on a jungle safari and what happens often is that you're looking for animals, but all you can see is lots and lots of green. And if you have a good tour guide, then of course he or she would tell you to, um, to listen carefully in, and maybe you can get an um, animal call. And now I want you to listen to the, to the calls I'm playing and think about, imagine what animal you might hear. And here you might think, well, I hardly heard anything, maybe a car passing by. What's that? Oh, it's a war. So maybe that was a tiger. Oh my God, what is that? I would think a dinosaur, but and that. Oh, well, we know that one, every child knows that was a trumpet. So yeah, it was an elephant. Or oh, what about this? This is ridiculously high. So you might think that this actually might be a mouse, but it's not, it's all the elephant. And here you can see the sounds I just played to you visualize. This is a spectrogram, which is the tool that us bioacousticians use to visualize and analyze sound. And this high-pitched squeaks that you just heard, you can see them here. So 
on the <clears throat> x-axis, you have uh, the time and on the y-axis, you have the frequency composition of the call. And where you have a lot of energy, you have here in red, the fundamental frequency, which uh, we perceive as the pitch of the call. So you can see here already that these calls are extremely high pitched compared to the low frequency sounds of the elephant, where the fundamental frequency even reaches into the infrasonic range. And the infrasonic means below the human hearing range, which is here. But also you can see that there is um, energy in the upper harmonics. The upper harmonics means that like natural sounds are rarely or never purely sinusoidal, but um, they have the fundamental frequency. And uh, then they have um, the upper harmonics, which are multiple integers of the fundamental frequency. So in the rumble, there's also lots of noise in the higher frequencies. And this is why it's only partially true that elephants talk in a secret language because they might perceive it differently, but we can also hear it if we are close enough at least. So here you see the low frequency rumble, you see a little bit higher here the trumpet, and then you see these extremely high pitched squeaks. And I'm just gonna play them again to you so you can um, really, relate the spectrogram to the sounds I was talking about. And this is a chorus because, you know, elephants are very social, they are mostly together and then they all um, vocalize together. <laughs> So what is so special about this high squeaking noises? I mean, as I said, they produce the low frequency rumbles and this is actually not surprising, but the high frequency squeaks are surprising to us. And this is because we, we are used to sounds made by mammals. They are mostly produced by the vocal folds where the air that um, we breathe out, uh, we put pressure on from the lungs it sets the vocal folds into vibration. And here, the larger the animal, the larger and more massive the vocal folds, and thus the lower the call. And here we see the vibrating vocal folds um, of a specimen of an African elephant. This has been made in the lab where artificial air pressure is put through it because you cannot actually put a camera into an elephant and look at the vocal folds, unfortunately. But what you see at this vibration rate, it um, relates very well to the lower fundamental frequency of the both African and Asian elephant rumbles. But for the higher calls, the trumpets, um, I mean, they can also produce very high pitched roars, but it can maybe still be produced by very tense vocal folds. But the trumpet, we know already it's um, produced by a blast of air through the trunk, so that it's not laryngeal anymore. And then the squeak is just over the top. So how can they do it with, with the vocal folds? We don't know. And as you see, the squeak is produced by Asian elephants and Asian elephants only. African elephants are not known to produce this high pitched sounds in their natural repertoire. Um, maybe because they are very flexible, they do it in the zoo. And it's not surprising that the repertoire of Asian and African elephants differs, because when we look at their evolutionary history, they split 7.5 million years ago, right? So that's longer uh, ago than the chimpanzees split from the humans. So of course there are differences, but also they have a lot in common. They all have stable social bonds within a very flexible matrilineal fission fusion society that builds on cooperation and alloparental care. And thus, of course, they are very communicative, um, use visual, tactile, chemical, and the acoustic signals. And what they also have in common is an amazing flexibility. The elephants are among the few mammals that are known to be able of vocal production learning. 
that means they are able to listen to a sound and then change their own vocal output, their own vocalizations accordingly. And in extreme cases, that even means that they are able to imitate sounds. So elephants and pinnipeds, bad cetaceans and humans are the only mammals that are known to be vocal learners. And of course we know that songbirds can do it and parrots and also even hummingbirds, but among mammals, this has been really rarely demonstrated. In African elephants, there was one young female that imitated, imitated the sounds of a person by a truck. And one African elephant actually tried to imitate the high squeak um, sounds of Asian elephants. And he somehow matched, he, you see in the spectrogram, he matched the temporal pattern, but he didn't get as high. And then there was one very fascinating Asian elephant in a green zoo, and he actually imitated um, the sounds of his trainer. It sounds like a very sassy elephant. So the trainer would say, hello, lie down. And then the elephant would just respond, like, hello, lie down. And you could imagine they would dispute for a while. But of course, um, we don't think that he actually knows what he's saying, but he was just imitating what he heard. And here he says, you can hear first the trainer saying good in Korean and then Koshik, uh, the elephant saying good. Yeah. Yeah. Which is remarkably similar. And um, some Korean people were asked if they can understand uh, what Koshik is saying and they can. And what is very special about that is that in order to produce this sound, he put his trunk tip into his own, own mouth. And this is really some amazing flexibility because just by his own mouth and his own uh, vocal track, he wouldn't be able to match the specific um, resonant frequencies that human speech produces. So he put um, the track tip into his mouth and this is something that has never been seen or described in any other elephant or in the wild. And of course, this, this behavior is very fascinating, vocal learning, we want to understand it better, but we don't know what function it really fulfills in the natural communicative system of elephants. And there, it is really hard to even start to understand that if we don't know how they produce their natural sounds and if they have to learn them or not. So we, we know so little about it that we really have to stay, to start at the basics here and ask, how do they even produce the high-pitched squeaks? And I have to say, when I started with that, with that task, I had no idea like, how to do that. We have to collect clues from different sides, from just different perspectives. And this is why I want to take you on a scavenger hunt with me, where except for me just telling you what I think they do is that we both like we all together collect clues and in the end come up with um, meaningful hypotheses in how they do that. So first we thought, let's go somewhere where we have uh, plenty of elephants, where we can get close to them. So we opted for a captive setting, but also where of course the, the elephants have a nice life and uh, we can observe natural behavior. So we went to Tiger Tops Nepal because they have 14 female elephants at that time. And they are kept in spacious enclosures and not chain. They are kept with um, their social companions. And also they frequently have the opportunity to go on jungle walks or to go for grazing at the riverside or for a swim and to interact socially. So we are able to also um, observe natural behavior. Uh, first of all, we just went there and we wanted to see what is the elephant doing. So I want you to do the same. Look at the elephant when it's squeaking and pay close attention to the vocal production 
organs that are here, like the mouth and the trunk, where we think it might, it might come from. And this is Pawan, and here she's begging for food, which is quite annoying. This is why it's successful. So I hope what you could see here is that um, when they squeak, they close the mouth, they close the chin, they retract the labial angles, and then they also depress the cheeks. So it's very conspicuous that there's something going on with the mouth. And in the last video, where you saw Kanchi um, at the fountain, she, she filled her whole trunk full with water. And uh, at the same time, she was still able to produce a squeak. That tells us that, well, most likely the trunk is not critically involved in squeak production because how would she use the trunk when it's full of water, right? So let's have a look at um, the anatomy. So that's the clue that we're gonna remember. Let's look at the anatomy of the elephant just to have, to collect some ideas like what 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 would be could be involved here. So we look into Pavan, of course, only virtually. Uh, this would be her skull cut in half, where you see here the oral cavity, and here you see the nasal tubes opening into the trunk, and here you have the um, soft tissues. Here you have um, the larynx with the vocal folds, the oral cavity with the, that is mostly filled by a huge tongue, but the tongue itself is not very flexible. Here it goes to the nasal passages. The velum can separate these two um, airways. And here you have some nasal cartilages that, um, for example, as humans, this would build the nose, but here are, of course, fused into the trunk. So what you see here, lots of possibilities. We know already that the rumble is produced by the larynx, probably the, the roar also, and it can be emitted through the mouth, but also through the trunk. And we have the trunk calls that are trumpets and snorts. And about the chir uh, the squeaks, they are also called sometimes chirps or squeals in the literature. Uh, we don't know really much, but someone Who's, who described the squeaks in the 70s already, she thought that, or maybe they are produced just like the trumpet, so with the trunk, but we don't know. And here are the muscles um, that could be involved in the sound production in closing the mouth. And here, what is interesting is that the muscles that go into the lower lips, they are um, developed, but not very well. But more importantly, uh, all the muscles that form the upper lip in uh, other mammals are here fused into building um, the trunk. So here are these other muscles that could be involved. So um, as we saw, there are so many possibilities to produce it either by the trunk or by the mouth, that first we thought what we really need to know is where the sound is emitted. How do you do that? I mean, luckily, there, are, there is a technical device that can visualize sound, and that is the acoustic camera. And this works just like our directional hearing. Um, you know, if there's a sound coming from the side, and we it takes longer to travel to one ear than to the other ear. 
So we have two ears and our brain by calculating the time differences of the sound arriving can tell us more or less where the sound comes from. So now if you imagine you have lots and lots of ears or lots and lots of microphones in that case, you can really clearly locate um, a sound source and then translate it into color coding, put it onto um, a, um, a video and see where it comes from. And I'm gonna play you a little video that describes how the acoustic camera works. The acoustic camera is an optic acoustic measurement tool and it's used to visualize sound sources. Um, it, the results really look very much like uh, the pictures that you might know from a big camera, um, where you see where the red dots are, it is very hot. And where the red dot is, is where the sound that you hear is produced. And here you see the um, behavioral experiments we did. So the elephants, they are very clingy. When you separate them, they start calling each other quite quickly. And then as soon as they reunite, they start to do exuberant choruses that involve squeaking. And here you see them reuniting. So you already saw this last squeak it was located around um, the mouth. And I will show you again, because we saw Pavan squeaking before, and this is very clearly where that comes from. Well, that's so clear, that's from the mouth. The next secret has been solved with the help of this camera, but also we were very lucky because Pavan is an especially skilled elephant. And she can not only do a squeak, but she can also do a snort and she can do both at the same time. I will play this video to you, but you can try to listen. So this was really quick. So I will show you um, some pictures. Here we have the squeak produced by the mouth. You can also see here the, uh, that there's high also energy in the upper harmonics. Um, and then you see here below this lower frequency sound that comes out of her trunk clearly. Uh, we think it's like um, a snort, so kind of like a trumpet, but she didn't put that much energy into it. So it's a very long snort. But the interesting thing is that of course, if she's able to produce a perfect squeak with the mouth and at the same time produce a perfectly fine snort with the trunk that, that clearly shows us that she doesn't need the trunk in order to produce the squeaks. And here we have her friend Dipendra who's at the same time producing um, another squeak. So this is where the acoustic camera is also really, really helpful because you have all these elephants vocalizing at the same time, producing even several sounds at the same time. And with the help of uh, the acoustic camera, you can really zoom in and see what happens at um, a specific frequency. And we recorded, um, we did this acoustic recording with three elephants. We had 90 calls that we could analyze and they all came from the mouth. So this is the other clue that we have to keep, keep in mind. So oh, of course, it would be great to look at the mouth, what they are really doing when they are speaking. 
But unfortunately, they always have the trunk in front. So it was never possible to directly observe the mouse. What I did instead is something very impolite. I was watching them eating and stared into the mouths when they did so, which I find is really relaxing. But I want you to play close attention to the lips here and see how closely they can close the lips in the longitudinal direction. Because as I told you, the upper lip is used here, the upper lip is used with the trunk. So they can't close the mouth, the mouth uh, as we do upper lower lip, but instead they close it tightly just using the lower lip, the left and right side of it. And sometimes it even partially overlaps. So you see here. So this is also something we have to consider. How could this play a role? But then you always have the skepticals, you know. And I would say, oh, I think, I still think it comes from the mouth, it must be a low in the call, right? So um, I told you before that the larger the animal, the lower the sound. And this also to a lower degree, but still holds true for the sounds within a species. So um, at least for the rumble, it has been shown that older and um, thus heavier elephants, they also have lower rumble frequencies. But in the for the squeak sound, we couldn't find that. Like if we look here at the mean fundamental frequency of a different um, calls of different individuals. So here we have different individuals from the age two to 60. So the older the elephant, the heavier the elephant, black is uh, females and red is uh, the males. And you clearly see that you can have a 50 year old, very large male elephant, but still the fundamental frequency of his squeaks is in the same range as um, the squeaks of a little girl of five years or two years. So it's hard to explain that with vocal folds because you would expect um, to then the sounds of little ones to be much higher, right? So look, let us look at other species. How do they do it? Because I told you that this um, frequency scaling rule, it holds to follow wingle sounds, but of course there are other species that also produce very high, high pitched sounds and that they don't use the vocal folds, how do they do it? So there's the Northern Elk, for example, or the Red, they also produce very high pitched sounds. And they actually do it by whistling. How does a whistle work? A whistle is actually a purely aerodynamic mechanism where air pressure is forced through a small orifice or over an edge, and that leads uh, to vortex shedding of this airstream and thus um, creates a sound pressure wave well, sound. And the red is uh, known to do that, um, the northern elk, and also doles or dogs even, they are known to whistle. And in that way, they can also produce at the same time um, low frequency sounds and high frequency sounds that occur simultaneously. So you might think, oh, maybe this is what the elephant does. And I mean, you can just try it actually. If you yourself do a whistle, I did that, I recorded my own whistle. That's what the spectrogram looks like. So what is typical of a whistle is that um, most of the energy is concentrated in the fundamental frequency. So it's a very pure tone. tone. But if you compare that to the squeaks that I showed you, you see that there's lots of energy also in the upper harmonics here. And this just doesn't fit with the squeak. So 
looking at the acoustic structure, we can say, no, a whistle production is not very likely. So then we tried other things. I, I thought, what is similar to that speaking sound? And it made me think of a balloon. And if you take a balloon and you squeeze the neck and you let air stream out of this balloon, then you can produce sounds like this. Which of course it's really annoying, but also you see how nicely actually this acoustic structure fits to the squeak sound production in the Asian elephant, because also here we have lots of uh, energy in the higher harmonics, right? But what, what does uh, an elephant mouth and a balloon have in common? Well, in the balloon, it works like that. The energy, uh, like the air pressure from the balloon, it streams through the neck and thereby sets um, the rubber in the neck into vibration. So here again, we have the tissue vibrating. What's the equivalent in the elephant? How could he do it? We thought maybe it is the lips that they can close so tightly. And so I tried myself. And actually it took me quite a while um, to learn how to do that. It's not that easy, but I did. And if you listen again to the elephant squeak, <laughs> well, that matches it quite nicely, actually. So we concluded because of the depressed cheeks, because um, it's clearly emitted orally, because they can tightly close the mouth and because the sound is not laryngeal and it's not a whistle, we concluded that it must be that they vibrate their lips. And this is actually known as lip buzzing because human trumpet players do that. But apart from human trumpet players, this sound production mechanism is not described anywhere else. Why is that interesting? I mean, now we found out that they seem to have a sound production mechanism that is not known anywhere else. Cool. But now we, um, I want to show you a bit when they squeak, not only how that we learn now, but when do they squeak. And it's mostly when they are excited. So in the beginning, we saw a video of Pawa when she's begging, and um, we saw another elephant who was excited because there was a car. And we saw Kanchi who was excited because her um, keeper was giving commands to her. And now we will watch a Pawan and Dipendra doing the things they normally do during a day and see when they get excited and squeak. So this is the, oh my God, we're going swimming this week. So exciting. And here are the, oh my God, that smells weird. Squeeze. They found some leftovers on the beach from um, actually plates, this leaf plates that people in Nepal eat for. They are so excited, she, even when she raises her tail and starts to eat. Oh my God, the storm. Yeah, that is so exciting. What is happening? Storm's over with raising. <clears throat> 
Did you hear that? Was that a car honking? Oh my God, that is so exciting. And we're back to grazing again and then. What is that, a dog passing by? Yeah, you better run. Oh my God, so exciting. And we're back to grazing peacefully. <laughs> what was that? Oh my God, so exciting. I have absolutely no clue what just happened. But sometimes you just see they are rose and you don't know what to get it. So all these calls occur in a close contact when the elephants are within um, a few body lengths of each other. It can be a arousal <clears throat> caused by an external trigger, like I just showed you, but as I, you saw in the experiment before also, when they greet each other after being separated, it can be in submissive, situations and also in human elephant interactions when they are begging when they are greeting actually um, a handler that they really like and some of them have learned to do that on command and maybe some of you might recognize this elephant which um, my dear friend and elephant professional colleague by Lam Jim recorded when she was doing research at Golden Time. Hello. Hello. So that was Yui doing a screen on command. And interestingly, when you look at the acoustic structure in more detail, you find that there's a lot of variation um, within the squeaks of one individual. They can do longer and shorter ones, but also there's a lot of uh, variation um, between individuals, so much so that it can, they can be uh, um, classified statistically. And but it also means that when even I or the persons that know the elephants well, they can hear the differences. They know which elephant is speaking. Like most probably they can also do that. And of course we need um, playback experiments to find out more about what the squeaks really mean in these situations. And if they can really um, recognize each other but um, it's very likely because we know that elephants can recognize each other from the rumble vocalizations that they do. But the most interesting individual differences here is that actually not all of the elephants we studied, not all of them produced squeaks when we were recording them. So we started out with a nice study group in Nepal well, we thought that would do it, that would be enough, but actually only four of the elephants squeaked there. So we went on to record um, calls in many other groups. And actually we found a similar pattern that in all these groups, only some of the elephants were squeaking, but that was regardless of their sex or age, we found squeaking elephants across all ages and both sexes. But what was really striking is that whenever we recorded a mother, she was able to squeak and she was still living with her offspring, then the offspring always also squeaked. And that makes you wonder what that means because first you might think, oh, maybe it's just the context, you know, some only do it very rarely and we might not have caught it. That might, okay, that makes sense. But also, I mean, we stayed in Nepal for over two months. We, our tent was in between the elephants. They, for the did squeaking, they did the squeaking, they did it all the time. We asked the handlers, they had worked with the elephants sometimes for decades. And they said, no, they, I never heard them squeaking. So we think that maybe because of that and because we have this contingency in mother offspring pairs and because maybe this, this production mechanism is not even that easy 
But yeah, we think maybe they have to learn it. And another clue for that is that actually we found one elephant in Cologne. Well, I thought, that's weird. She's not moving her cheeks. That's weird. Maybe she does it differently. And actually she does. She does it with the trunk. And this is a paper that is in progress at the moment. So this was really surprising because not only did we learn an, about a new sound production mechanism, which adds to the flexibility um, of, of production mechanisms that we already knew are there in elephants, like the vocal folds are also uh, sounds produced by the trumpet. Now we have a third production mechanism, but also that maybe there is some learning involved here and it's, it would be really interesting to study that further. Um, if you want to look up everything that I just taught and look at more videos, um, this work has been recently published and here you find the citation. And while we look at Sita walking into the sunset, I want to make you think about why these findings, how they are, can be important for the elephant themselves, not only for us in a, because it's interesting in a scientific way, like how much do they learn? What do they use the communication for? But also when you think that these chords might be learned and learned within the family unit, think about how important the family unit is for the elephants and how important it is to preserve these family units in order to allow them to learn everything that they need to know, which has implications of course on animal welfare how are they kept can they be kept in a family unit even in captivity because uh, sadly this is not um, the re reality in in most in many captive settings still and also if we think about con conservation of course do we only want to protect a populations or do we only want to protect a smaller like family units because to preserve the culture that is potentially there and I hope with that that we have some ideas um, for the discussion and I want to thank everyone who was involved in the study my supervisor Angela Stöger and all the collaborators and um, of course all the facilities where we were able to record elephants especially of course Tiger Tops Nepal where we did most of the research. I want to thank you for your attention and I hope that there are some questions. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, well, I have a question, but I'm gonna save it till, till very last to see whether we've got, because it's, it's a tricky one. <laughs> oh, I like um, it. it it's a, it, but does anybody from, so first of all, from the Zoom, do we, do we have any, uh, Questions? Any of you in the waiting room? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? No. Okay. Well, it's obviously very well explained, so that's very, very good. That's true. I, um, Nisa, are there any questions on the uh, any questions on the Facebook that you would like to unmute yourself and ask? So for Facebook, um, let's give them a few more minutes. I think everybody is gathering their brains around it. <laughs> My question would be, when can Veronica fly out here and do some ah. recording with us? <laughs> I know, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could send you all like, I wish if I have the equipment and everything, I could send you all this different yeah. sound that, you know, our elephant are doing because wow. there are some really interesting one. And I definitely noticed that there are tonal differences between all the elephants and I can pick them out if judging that if I know the general direction where they come from and there are some sound that I always ask myself like how does the elephant does this and how is it different from other things that they do but um let's see so uh part of my question is going to be on the, about the so you said the elephant does squeak when they are in excitement Mm -hmm. Do you notice a difference between sort of like a positive stimuli like feeding or excitement versus um, something like scare from the cars or anything like does does is there like a different sound that contain with it or? Um, this is something that it would be interesting to have a closer look at. 
we were not really able to do that too much because then you would need the elephants to we need squeaks in all the different contexts from the same right. because they are so individually distinct you know that you really have to have enough calls from each individual in each context and we didn't have enough right. calls uh, to do any statistical analysis with that but what i can tell you from what i perceived is um that i think when they are begging then that then um the squeaks are uh much more um like not variable they are more stable they are all the same it's it's a begging internet, internet, internet. but if, if they are really aroused if it's social arousal or because they are scared they are more modulated they go longer and they are more modulated so um when i'll be able to collect more data on that maybe we will find also differences in the different contexts Oh, I see. Well, thank you. So there are some questions coming in from Facebook. So first one is from, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name right, it's uh, Biho. He said that, is there any study of this behavior in wild elephants? Yep. Yeah. So um, the squeak has been described before in the wild, and it has also been described already that um, they do this when they are somehow excited. And, and also when they play, for example, little ones, but also, of course, they are excited when they play. So in general, yeah, this sound has been described in the wild. It is known that they do produce it there. But there was never any like in detail study that looked at, for example, individual differences that we described here, or how different are these calls even. Like in the different studies um, that were done before this one, um, the call was described as um, chirp, like squeaks in a sequence, or squeal that is like this long, longer squeak. But, and they thought, hey, maybe these are even um, different calls, but now when we look at it, we find it's all variation that one individual can do. Like one individual can do a bit longer or they can do it in a sequence or not. So there's a lot of detail to that, to that squeak that had not been studied before. And then also we were not able to look at all the details. Yeah, there's a lot more to do. Oh, I Especially, see. Um, I think what is interesting yeah. is, uh, of course, to see if they do it in the wild more often. If we think they learn it, maybe, you know, that more individuals would do it in the wild. This would be definitely interesting to look at. Yeah, definitely. Another question come from Sabrina, and she asks, let's see. Um, um, so we know that the African elephant doesn't squeak like the Asian one does, but do they evolve some other sound that might represent something very close to a squeak in Asian elephants? Yes, actually they do. So I mentioned in the beginning that it's not part of their natural repertoire. That is, I mean, the, the African elephant has been extensively studied, the, the communication. Um, in the wild too and so it is known that they don't usually squeak however um there is a squeak sound described if you look at the uh, um elephant esogram that is done on the embrocele elephants you can see that there was one elephant who actually squeaked um it looks like he does it with the trunk mm -hmm. so yeah I think in very rare cases, and maybe you'd find that also in, in captive elephants, that some of African elephants um, squeak, but they might do it differently. And it's not something that is part of the natural habitat, um, natural communication system. But as I said, they are so flexible. Like they make lots of weird sounds that we don't know if they make any sense or if they just do it because they can. And um, so, yeah, some some African elephants might do it, maybe just for fun. Who knows? Mm, okay. Um, let's see another question come in. Um, for, in your opinion, if 
if it's basically a domestic, so it's basically if it's a captive elephant that you find in the zoo or in a foundation or a sanctuary versus elephant that might be nearby in the wild, would they understand each of the voices or sound that they make? Like, do they have like a language that they can probably talk in? Probably, I don't know. <laughs> this is a very interesting question and I would love to know. Um, I think that we need to learn more about really what is the meaning behind these calls first. Um, in African elephants, it has been shown that wambos, they really in, they um, encode information about how big is the collar, which sex does the collar have. And I think that this kind of stable information that this, of course, other elephants would also be able to perceive. Like if an elephant hears another elephant that he would know, okay, this is a big one or this is a small one, right? But what kind of um, flexible information is really in there? What do they tell each other? That is, therefore we need more studies and then also do playback studies. Again, here in African elephants, it is better known. In African elephants, we know that they can warn each other about, look, there's a bee or, oh, there's um, a human hunter coming. And if they play back these sounds for the bee sounds, for example, the other elephants would shake their heads. So they know, oh, this, this is a bee alarm call. So there's some information really in that call. And for the Asian elephants, we don't know that yet. We have to test it, uh, right? But, for the, like for the zoo elephants, what well, I used to annoy them actually because I wanted to make them squeak to in order to record the squeaks is that I played mm -hmm. back calls from strange elephants, uh, and oh. they really they don't like that. <laughs> 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 I don't know what it's kind someone of they don't know. So they're they like, get. who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Why are you here? Who's that? <laughs> they get really excited yeah. about it and they form this. Right. Um, this bunching group where they, you mm -hmm. know, they, they, yeah, they, they put their, their back together, together yeah. And, and then they start squeaking and making all different kinds of noises. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so what is the youngest elephant age that you find that could squeak, actually? The youngest elephant I found uh, was two years old. Two years old. Yes. Oh. Uh, it would be interesting to, to really, what I want to do so much, it's really <laughs> <laughs> so much to do. <laughs> it's, it's watch them closer, how they learn it. Because I've ob observed these mother offspring pairs. And um, sometimes it's like the younger elephant, like the calf is trying to squeak, but it's not really doing it. Why? Oh. <laughs> okay, I can do it too well now, but like the little elephant would more be like. <laughs> yeah. It looks oh, like definitely, yeah. <laughs> It, it definitely has probably it has to do with how um, the development of the muscles around the facial muscles and the control of everything, too. So it's, it okay. is probably just like human, like you hear the word that or, well, when they're a baby, they just sort of just mimic what the mom and dad side try to say as as close as they can. And then it's just refining that when they're a bit older and they start to put two and two together, it's like, oh this sound mean a word basically. So maybe it's yeah. like that for the elephant yeah. too. Probably there's, there's, as you say, there's both of it. There's a cognitive process of processing and then forming a template of the sound that was heard and then matching it with the, with the own output. But uh, of course there's also a mat maturation process of the organs that are necessary to produce these sounds. And, for example, when, when they are born, the elephants, they cannot, um, they cannot trumpet from the beginning on because, I mean, we've often seen these pictures with the, the baby elephants and their floppy trunks, you know, they, they really have to learn how to control the muscles first before they can actually right. use it to produce sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So the official term for this sound is a squeak, or is there any other official word that you would put in association with? Uh, I wouldn't say official, it is um, the term that we use now, mm, mm -hmm. but uh, it has been called also chirp before. Right. And it was described as squeaks in a sequence is then a chirp or the longer 
we heard very long calls, um, mm -hmm. which were termed squeals, and they are all uh, legit um, descriptions, you know. But we 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 stayed uh, with squeak for now um, because of the variation that we found within right. individuals and between of them. You know, there's no clear cut categorization where you say now the squeak ends and the squeal begins because they can right. do all of it and they can it's it's a graded variation so it's hard to really put it into distinct categories you know mm -hmm. and also yeah. because i studied cheetah chirps so there it's called chirps and then i have all these files with chirps and i wanted the <laughs> elephant to be different <laughs> <laughs> right 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 yeah i see yeah so if it's if it's really based on the lips or the mouth per se, can they do it in both while they're inhaling? So when they're breathing in and breathing out, like where does this like wind production go forward? Does it come out or does it actually sucking in kind of thing? This is a very good question and one that I cannot finally answer. I think uh, mm. why, I, why, why I think that they produce it by pushing air out is because I showed you Pawan, right? And she's producing the snort. And uh, at the same time, she's producing the squeak, right? So I thought she's pushing air mm -hmm. out of the trunk and maybe simultaneously pushing air out of the mouth. But maybe she's like a didgeridoo player and she can inhale and exhale at the same time. Right, right, right. I don't really know. I wanted to observe um, the respiration of the elephants, but it's quite tricky because um, their lung is uh, fixed actually with the rib cage. It's attached to right. the rib cage, right? And uh, right. see the elephant breathing is not so easy. You can see it at the hip a bit. But it's not, if you concentrate both on the mouth and on the hip, yeah, it's not really yeah. that easy. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I recorded one, this huge male, Maxi, this huge male, I saw that he, it's the only elephant where I could really perceive it, that he did the squeaks when exhaling. But I told you that there's mm -hmm. even one elephant who does the squeak with the trunk. So why, if there's such a flexibility, I think it's, definitely possible that they could also do it when when inhaling so doing egress i mean if you try it's also possible and you will also see movement here so in the end right i don't really know it's all possible but it's still the little yeah. bit of vibrating in that uh, context so it's it's still the same mm. source there are now a thousand people around the world going <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought I'd butt in. I was doing that a lot on the metro to practice, and people were looking at me strangely. <laughs> right. Sorry, I Nisa, mean, I don't go. know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we can. Maybe we can teach elephant to beatbox or something for John. Maybe we're on to something. <laughs> we should. Not my elephant. <laughs> Yeah, so I saw that Brian, uh, there is a participant that has a question. Yeah. So do you want to unmute yourself, Ryan, over there or? Yeah, go ahead, Ryan, ask your question yourself. We want to, we want to hear your voice. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I was keeping myself unmuted because I had quite a lot of background noise here. So I just wanted to ask Veronica, is it possible that the squeak has a real sort of self-satisfying physical element to it. And that is like the primary driver behind, behind squeaking with that will to communicate or, you know, or for others to interpret its emotion being secondary to that action. Um, I think there's some possibility to that because um, it's this oval sound and what I've observed is that when the elephants are really, really excited, what they would do is um, put their trunk tip or their trunk into their mouth and bite on it. And this seems to, he to have some um, self, um, you know, calming um, function, such as self-scratching in monkeys, right? And uh, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't think that it would be like the primary um you know trigger but but maybe it plays a role along with that you know that they do it I mean I really think because it's a you would if that would be the case you would expect it to happen also when the elephant is alone and this is not the case like when you play back the strange elephant sounds to an elephant that is standing there alone and you know this is a squeaking elephant it will not squeak it will make all the other noises, but it will only start squeaking as soon as another elephant is close by. So this is why I think it has more of a communicative function, but uh, you, it doesn't it exclude you either, it may be both. Thank you. I mean, I think you can ask, it's, it's when, when, when we meet sometimes we make silly noises, are we doing that for communication or are we doing that to, to we're communicating our, friendship we go way when you see someone you haven't seen for a long time you're communicating your friendship but also you're getting it's it's it, it has both roles at the same time you're getting a, a good feeling from it as well so um i i think entirely possible right sorry you're not asking me but never mind I'm answer <laughs> no that's absolutely fine <laughs> thanks to both of you <laughs> yeah i also think that that's that's also highly possible that they are doing it to i don't know satisfy a certain thing it could be, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking this, but maybe there, if you're basically working, say, with operant conditioning, where, you know, where we do the target training, and we word the elephant with good when they're doing something good, and the elephant gets to eat, maybe what they're doing is they squeak so that we can feed them something. So maybe they are conditioning us to feed them, <laughs> Definitely. which I also see I mean in some of the elephants. <laughs> I mean, you heard Pawan in bow, um, for example, begging sounds. <laughs> she would do that, and she has definitely in, a, in sort of like a begging kind of thing. Yes, exactly the begging, because she she's doing it, and she starts doing it at four o'clock in the morning. Like she wakes everyone up in the camp, and she has definitely conditioned people to feed her when she's squeaking. So yes, definitely. And I'm sorry, I think I was talking at the same time here because the sound didn't come too. Okay, Nisa, do we have anything else? Um, hold on, let me do another refresh. There I go, making sound that is not meant for communication <laughs> over there. <laughs> Um, nothing for my side at this time. Uh, Facebook has gone kind of quiet at the moment. Okay, well, and Veronica, do you want to hear a rhino? Do you want to be put on the spot and hear a rhino and then give us your, um, give us your impressions of what's going on there? Because obviously you, you bumped into quite a few rhinos whilst you were, uh, whilst you were at Tiger Tops and their full, okay. and their full vocal range is, um, is quite amazing. So, um, yeah, let's yep. see. I'm not a wino expert, but <laughs> I can try it. And bear in mind that before I show these videos, that when I lived at Tiger Tops it was well over 20 years ago now. So the the um, the, the uh, resolution of the film is not very good. But I think there are, are uh, rhino noises on this video. So let me hey. see what I can do. Are you seeing it? Yes. This is from the old tented camp, by the way. Ah, oh, good old times.
So these are two boys fighting, are they? Should this tactical zoom lens be made illegal? Well, that's some amazing footage you got there. Well, they so now, so there you go on the spot. Of course, you've got the rhino, everybody, <laughs> but the whistle at the end, how do they do that? <laughs> if I would only know. <laughs> so, with, um, with rhinos, it's the same. They. Um, these are also called squeals in the rhinos, and it's known that they do it, but again, it's not really known how they do it. This would be a whole other story, which I'm happy to do at some point, but no, we don't really know. I mean, uh, I know, I, unfair yeah. of me to put, put, put you on the spot. I just remembered. No, when, it's great. I love, I, I love that. that you know away. I had that video <laughs> tucked away on my YouTube that I would, I, I would show it to you. It was great to see it because. Um, it's a very interesting thing because you heard that first they did this low frequency sound, which yep. was like an aggressive sound. Yep. And then why, why did it do the high pitched one afterwards? That you don't, know, it can be a submissive signal because high pitched sounds are often submissive, but it can also be a, a, that it's some signal to the female actually, yep. because um, this is known from um, African rhinoceroses that they squeal they start squealing when the female is leaving the territory. And it seems to be some kind of, you know, trick, like maybe they, they sound like a little one. So the female comes back, like, oh, I'm so cute. I don't know what they really doing. But uh, this is one of the ideas that this is why they squeal. Well, now really that, interesting. Would, yeah. that would be amazing because I, I bet I'm going to put you even more on the spot and I bet nobody, nobody here can give you the answer is how, how long ago the Asian one-horned rhinoceros separated from either of the African species, <laughs> if indeed they are related at all. So um, anyway, um, I think we're probably going off topic here and we could be stuck, you and I and everybody else watching for another hour and a half if we, if we get yeah. too far into this. So we'd better, unless, if, unless there are any other questions on Facebook or anywhere else, um, we'd better, better wrap it up and let you go and let our audience go so um i think all that remains for me to say is thank you very much for your uh, for the talk and thank you very much for fascinating um incitement and and a willingness to, to to take on some curveballs towards the end and thank you to everybody who asked questions as well some some great and um and and well well informed questions towards the end and thank you nisa for your opinions it was all a very a very, very nice talk today um, and a, a nice hour and a bit um as far as we're concerned i think we're back tomorrow with two more live streams if anybody would like to see elephants in the flesh and possibly communicating um they don't always chirp or squeak or roar or rumble when they're when they're on the live streams because they don't always get excited and this afternoon's was three elephants standing around doing nothing which is quite hard to commentate um so we're doing that uh, we do also have a clubhouse tomorrow evening at the elephant conservation group uh in thai um about the um wet season ailments of elephants so those of you who are Thai and who do club housing please do have a look at our conserva uh, elephant conservation uh, group and um, you can join in for that and uh, I think that is it so thank you very much Veronica um, thank you do come and see us when you can let's get let's take this camera of yours out to Nepal as well and we can try and get some rhinos um, and see what's happening there they're fairly easy to find but having them having them squeak is, is a fairly rare occurrence but um, we, I'm sure we can we can do that um yeah we might find a way <laughs> we might find a way exactly. <laughs> okay so thank you very much um thank you to everybody for watching namaste cop and cap and we will we will see everybody tomorrow on the uh, on the lockdown live stream <laughs>